Well, I appreciate everyone being here tonight and and uh, hope they're all doing well and hope that this lesson I uh, present tonight will be of some benefit to you. But I want to kind of give you a little background information that uh, just kind of lead into the, the lesson. And it uh, may be interesting or it may be just boring, but as many of you know, I, I began my life as a, as a country boy or I'd perhaps better describe it as a farm boy. Now, Nancy will uh, no, uh, likely say that I'm still a country boy uh, with no hope of changing. Well, maybe so, but uh, back on the farm, there was uh, not much money, so we had to be very resourceful in uh, the way of the accomplishment of tasks necessary to the successful operation of the farm. So whatever task my father assigned to me and my three brothers, as far as I can recall, yeah, he never gave us any instructions as to the proper, most efficient uh, means to accomplish any given task. As a result, uh, each of us became sufficiently self-reliant uh, to ar arrive at solutions to a given problem without any input from our father. But then again, maybe we just muddled through or learned all the wrong ways to achieve something that looked like efficiency. Well, at any rate, none of the four of us uh, became farmers, which uh, probably is a good thing for farming. Of course, the uh, farming operation is primarily, if not exclusively, concerned with agriculture. Uh, up until the time I was about nine or 10, or maybe younger, uh, one cash crop that we had was cotton. Now, I hated cotton. I had a chop cotton and pick cotton. After cotton was planted and sprouted, it had to be thinned to increase the uh, yields of the cotton fiber. And chopping was the process of uh, eliminating the excess crowding of the plants. I hated it because there were too many decisions to, to make. Which seedlings to chop, which ones to let remain? Couldn't make my mind. I hated picking cotton. We picked cotton in late uh, August, early September. And as you know, it's always hot in those months. You may have heard the term uh, walking in tall cotton. Now that saying was derived from the uh, taller height of the pre-mechanization variety of cotton. There were tall plants and short plants and tall plants were easier to pick. Uh, when mechanical pickers came into general use, hybrid cotton was introduced to accommodate the uniform plant height needed by the mechanical pickers. Unfortunately, tall cotton was a thing of the past. Cotton was now low to the ground. You never had a backache until you had a cotton picking backache. And I hated it. Because of uh, bow weevil infestation and in the uh, cotton root rot fungus, uh, as well as we, as well as uh, most farmers in our area, and really uh, most of the state of Texas, they ceased to raise cotton. Now, that was a great relief to me. Uh, most farmers became cattle farmers exclusively, exclusively, exclusively. Now, it, it'd probably be more accurate to say they became grass and forage farmers, because that's what cows ate and the primary forage crop was oats and as boys uh, my brothers and I were never confused about what we were growing or the steps necessary to produce a certain crop whether it was cotton corn oats vegetables or what have you we knew the ground had to be prepared and the seed planted and the crop harvested there was a sowing and a reaping Sowing involved more than just casting seed. Reaping was just as involved. If we planted cotton, we never expected wheat to come up. If we planted oats, we never expected sorghum to come up. What we sowed is what we expected 
and what we got. We never expected anything else. Of course, the uh, quality of the harvest depended to a large extent on the uh, preparation. For the entirety of human existence, mankind has been engaged in agriculture. So it's not surprising that the Bible uses many agricultural terms and examples, such as sowing and reaping. One cannot read the Bible without coming to the realization that this concept permeates scripture. And just a few examples follow. In Matthew, the third chapter, verses 7 through 12, I'm not going to read all these verses. I'll just point out a few uh, items in them. That was when John uh, the Baptist, he was baptizing in the Jordan. And of course, the Pharisees and Sadducees came up and they wanted to be baptized. And, and he uh, got on their case and he says, uh, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And he went on to say that every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And he further said his winnowing fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. There was a sowing and there's a reaping. In Matthew, the seventh chapter, verses 16 through 20, he says, you will know them by the fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. By the fruits you will know them. There's a sowing and a reaping there. In Matthew, the 13th chapter, uh, 24 through 30, and we'll cover this some more later. And of course, that's the parable of the uh, wheats and the tares. Uh, not, we won't cover this one. We'll cover the uh, soils. He, in there, he talked about the kingdom of heaven is, heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But, I mean, that's a sowing. But the enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. Well, that's a sowing also. So when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So there's going to be a reaping. And of course, he was asked, you know, you uh, go get the tares. And he said, no, wait, and we'll just gather the tares later which he did, and uh, so that's a sowing and a reaping. In Job 4, verse 8, it says, Even as I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same as sowing and reaping. Psalms 7, chapter, verses 14 uh, through 16, Behold, the wicked brings forth iniquity, yes, he conceived trouble and bring forth falsehood. He made a pit and dug it out and has fallen into the ditch which he made. His trouble shall return upon his own head and his violent dealing shall come down on his own crown. That's a sowing and a reaping. Jeremiah, the fourth chapter, verse 18. Your ways and your doings have procured these things for you. This is your wickedness because it is bitter, because it reaches to your heart. In Hosea 8, uh, verses 7, they sow the wind and reap the whirlwind. We've heard that many times. In Hosea, a little later on, 10th chapter, verses 12 through 13, sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. You have plowed wickedness, you have reaped iniquity. You have eaten the fruit of lies because you trusted in your own way in the multitude of your mighty men. So this is not the only place, but this is just a, a few scriptures where we see the truth. Often expressed that we will reap what we sow. And we will sow something. Now I would like to use as the basis uh, for our lesson tonight, the passage found in Galatians, the seventh, the sixth chapter, verses seven through ten. And it reads, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap 
everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. In verse 10, I'm just throwing in because I like it. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those of the household of faith. Now, there are some uh, commentators who say that this is in reference to the treatment of ministers in the matter of their financial support, uh, support because of what is said in verse 6 preceding. Let him who has taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. But it's far too limiting to restrict the uh, restrict, uh, application of verses 7 following to only what is said in verse 6. Albeit the sharing of verse 6 must be included in the sowing of verse 7. The sowing to the flesh and the sowing to the spirit of verse 8 relate directly to the works of the flesh and, and the fruit of the spirit set forth in, in Galatians 5th chapter verses 16 through 25 preceding. It would seem that the apostle had a much broader application in mind. Indeed, yeah, these passages express a general principle. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. If, this, if that is the case, uh, and it is, then our lives in the flesh are of the utmost importance for our present actions will decide our, our eternal destiny and oftentimes our status in this present life. Everything we do is a sowing of which the eternity will be the reaping. God's laws of sowing and reaping are as immutable as his nature. They are inexorable and cannot be denied. Paul warns us not to be deceived. Now, the Greek word translated deceive in verse 7 is not the same Greek word translated deceive in verse 3 preceding. In verse 3, the idea is uh, of a mind misleader. One misleads himself by incorrectly, incorrectly describing to himself unwarranted attributes. His own ego has misled him. In verse 7, there is some outside influence that seeks your deception. That outside influence is Satan, the great deceiver. Satan's greatest power is his ability to deceive. He will use every means at his disposable, disposal, including your ego, to accomplish this result that is your deception. This is how he caused Eve to commit sin. We read in Revelation 12, chapter verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. And he was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So it is not merely his power to deceive just you and you only, but his power to deceive the whole world. It's an awesome power used by him to great effect. Now we dis disregard this power at our own peril. We must not deceive ourselves by saying that sin is not a reality. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, it says there, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We should not be so overconfident that we think uh, sin cannot reach us. We read in 1 Corinthians 10, chapter verse 12, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Paul, in this letter from which our passage and consideration is taken, at the beginning of the chapter wrote, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual restore such one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourselves lest you also be tempted. In our thoughts and actions, great care must be exercised lest temptation lead us into sin. What cannot be avoided in our analysis of, of a passage and consideration is that God is all-knowing. We can be deceived, 
and even deceives ourselves, deceive ourselves. God however sees all and knows all. It is impossible for man to deceive God. Jesus, both man, uh, God and man, stated that he knew what was in man. In John the second chapter, verses 24 and 25, we read in part that he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Of course, you well know that uh, uh, deception and attempts to deceive occur in secular matters. All you have to do is listen to ads. To be deceived in spiritual matters is to profess that some spiritual thing or condition is true when God says it is not. That is an effort to mock God, that is, to treat God as if he doesn't know what he's talking about. In that sense, God cannot be mocked because he is all-knowing. But many, if not most, by their actions, trifle with God. He is not to be trifled with. He will not, he will not see his laws broken with impunity, his name disrespected, his gospel despised, or his son rejected. He is intensely sensitive to the actions of mankind. He takes note of the acts, words, and thoughts of those he has created. If one remains impenitent to the end of this present age, God will say to him as he did in Isaiah's day, I will rid myself of my adversaries, and take vengeance on my enemies. That's in the first chapter of Isaiah, second part of verse 24. We should do as the apostle Peter implored his readers. And if you call on the father who without partiality judges, that's a reaping, according to each one's work, that's sowing, conduct yourselves, that's each one's work, Throughout your time of your stay here in fearing, that's the time for sowing. That's in First Peter, the first chapter, verse 17. One's conduct or work is a voluntary action. Paul wrote about this in his letter to the Romans. In Romans, the sixth chapter, verses 16 through 18, he wrote this. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves as slaves to obey? That's a voluntary action. You are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart at the voluntary action, that form of doctrine which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. In my introductory remarks, I mentioned that in our forming operations, the soil had to be prepared properly to receive the seed. Provided that all appropriate preparations were made and the land blessed with timely rain, then a bountiful crop was produced. Likewise, a proper spiritual sowing necessitates that a proper preparation of the heart be made so that the sowing will result in a bountiful reaping. Verse 8 of our passage in the consideration says, For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So there are two general kinds of sowing that could occur, namely sowing to the flesh and sowing to the Spirit. We want to sow to the Spirit rather than sow to the flesh. If we sow to the Spirit, then we will reap the fruit of the Spirit, which ultimately is everlasting life. We read in Romans, the first chapter, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. We could have, could have substituted salvation for everlasting life. Uh, in both passages and done no injustice to either passage. It is worth noting that 
those in torment are never described as having everlasting life. Everlasting existence, yes. Everlasting life, no. So, how do we sow to the Spirit? Uh, first, we need to acknowledge that we are subjects of a power higher than ourselves. Sowing to the Spirit lifts our own sowing above the passions and desires of the flesh. If we are to be Christ, then we must crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. As Paul writes, if we live in the Spirit, let, let us also walk in the Spirit. The notion of walking is a metaphor for, for one's conduct. Therefore, one, one who uh, walks in the Spirit is led and guided by the Spirit of God. As we know from Ephesians 6, chapter verse 17, the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. We can therefore say that to be led and guided by the Spirit of God is to be led and guided by the Word of God. So what's involved in being led and guided? Well, hearing and doing go together. James had this to say, but be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty can, can, and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. That's found in the first chapter of James, verses 22 through 25. So without, without a doubt, one must hear the word that saves. Paul wrote in Romans, the 10th chapter, verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how, they, how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? However, it is the character of the hearer that determines the effect that the word has on him. Did not Jesus say, therefore, take heed how you hear, Luke 18, 18, and also take heed what you hear, Mark 4, 24? Of course, uh, this says something of the character of the preacher, but emphasis must not be taken away from the critical import of the disposition of the mind of the hearer. In explaining the parable of the souls, Jesus said that those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience, Luke 8, 8 uh, chapter 15, verse 15. An attentive and perceptive hearer will make even the average preacher seem exceptional. But even the greatest preacher of all Jesus Christ could not persuade those not having the proper disposition of heart. It is not impossible for the sin hardened heart to be penetrated by the sword of the Spirit. Speaking of the parable of the soils found in the 13th chapter of the book of Matthew, and that's also found in Mark 4, 4th chapter of Mark, and 8th chapter of Luke, we find parables dealing with the uh, nature of the kingdom and those to whom appeal would be made. The first parable in appearing in this great chapter is the parable commonly known as the parable of the soils. In the explanation of the parable, Jesus says that the soils are a representative of the hearts of men. And the seed is the word of God, that is the sword of the spirit. The wayside soil is representative of one whose heart is so hardened by evil, perverse thoughts, indifference, or thoughtless acceptance of tradition as to be impenetrable, impenetrable by the word of God. The second soil, the stony places, had no depth to withstand the trials and tribulations of life and soon gave up any sustenance of the seed, that is, the word of God. Such is the heart of the impetuous one who in the emotion of the moment exceeds to most anything, not counting the cost of growing and producing for the kingdom. The third soil was good soil in that it was a favorable medium for germination and sustenance of growth. However, 
contained within that soil were the progenitors of thorns as well as the good fruit. The soil readily accepted the good seed, nurtured it to life, and sustained its growth. It did not, however, rid itself of the thorns, but provided for its growth also. And the thorns choked the very life out of the offspring of the good seed, so that no fruit was produced. Of course, the fourth soil represents the person with the noble and good heart, or again, as it's worded in the King James Version, the good and honest heart, who upon hearing the word, that is the seed, believes it, understands it, and keeps it, therefore, thereby producing fruit many times over. Well, it's not sanctification and salvation the ultimate blessing. Yes, it is. So one who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, as quoted previously, is not just a casual observer of some interesting phenomena. He believes what he sees and hears with the result that he does it. He continues in it. That is, he walks in the spirit. In the preaching to the Jews gathered at Pentecost, Peter reminded them what the prophet Joel had said, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's Joel, uh, second chapter, verse 32. So what is the calling on the name of the Lord? In that same uh, section in the Acts, he spoke to them concerning the resurrection of the Christ, which, by which evidence they were convinced of their complicity in the cruci crucifixion of the one they now believed was both Lord and Christ. They implored Peter, men and brethren, what shall we do? They were calling on the name of the Lord. That is, they were appealing to Peter to let them know what they must do to please God. Of course, Peter told them what they must do. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. One might think that with all that I learned growing up on the farm that I would be able to have a little garden out and back that produced an abundance of vegetables to share with everyone. However, uh, regardless of what I learned growing up, if I cannot now put it into practice, I end up with a crop of weeds, which I'm willing to share if anybody wants some weeds. In a similar fashion, one who hears the word without obedience ends up with a hardened heart. The one who is, in some sense, affected by what he hears, yet takes no action, only makes himself more impervious to the truth when it is again presented to him. Repeated resistance to the truth will in time render him past feeling, as Paul wrote in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verses 17 through 19. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles, uh, Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understand, understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness to work all in plainness with greediness. No, let's not be like the Gentiles of old. Let each of us commit ourselves to sow to the Spirit and not to the flesh. If we do so, Paul is speaking to us when he uh, wrote, but the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. That's found in 2 Thessalonians 3rd chapter, verses 3 and 4. When it says doing the things commanded, well, they, there's the rub. This requires effort. Work is a proactive challenge. Paul wrote in Ephesians, the 2nd chapter, verse 10, that we were created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. There should be a sense of urgency about our 
working righteousness. As Paul wrote, as recorded in our passage for this lesson, and let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Even Jesus was a worker, for his words recorded in John 9, chapter verse uh, 4 said that he must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Paul warned us to, uh, to guard against growing weary while doing good. If it, were not, if it were not possible to grow weary, if it were not possible to lose heart, he would not have warned us. Not losing heart, or as the King James Version phrases it, if we faint not, is a challenge that all must face. But we do not face these challenges alone. As the prophet Isaiah uh, wrote, that God gives power to the weak. That's in the first half of Isaiah 40, chapter verse 29. In chapter 11, the writer of Hebrews set forth a litany of the faithful who endured untold hardships without losing heart. Although they received a good testimony, of which we have the record, they did not receive the promise. We have received the promise. And the writer goes on to say to us these words recorded in Hebrews 12th chapter verses 1 through 3. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, that's those that are set forth in chapter 11, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him, Jesus, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. No one is immune to fainting and weariness, uh, even though we ascribe it more often to those who, because of the age, experience physical fee, uh, fatigue more so than the young. But that is not so, as Isaiah says, even the youth, youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That's the uh, Isaiah 40, verses 30 and 31. Waiting on the Lord is placing our trust in Him. By God's good pleasure, then, let us wait on the Lord. Then we will soar like eagles, run and not be weary and walk and not faint. Our sowing of obedience will allow us to reap salvation. Therefore, let us trust in his promises and submit our will to his. We can do no less and be pleasing to him and more of us he does not ask. So the next time you sit down to a meal and have, I have placed before you the bounty produced by sowing and reaping, let it remind you of the spiritual sowing and reaping that will lead to salvation or condemnation. Thank you for your kind attention. I hope this has been useful to you.